So this morning we'll focus on a few passages um, from Scripture, uh, looking at specifically um, the Lord Jesus' work in the ancient city of Antioch. Um, so Acts chapter 11, uh, verses 19 through 20, or 19 through 30, Acts 13, 1 through 3, and then also Galatians 2, verse 11 through 14. All of these passages speak about uh, the church in Antioch. And so, beloved brothers and sisters in Christ here in Richmond Hill, now gathered as Bethel Church, we're going to talk about another church. It's kind of an odd thing to do, isn't it? To talk about another church when you're gathered here in Richmond Hill as the church of Jesus Christ. It would certainly be odd if uh, we were talking about another contemporary church. If we talked about some church in uh, China or in Singapore or uh, spoke about a church in Hamilton or Niagara or somewhere in the States. It'd be very odd if we spent all of our time together talking about uh, some other contemporary church. Now sadly, knowing a little bit about the human heart, if I mentioned some church in Ontario and said, let's talk about that church. Quite a few ears would perk up, be like, oh, that would be exciting. I want to know what we think of this church. But for us to say, let's talk about the Antioch church, quite a few of us might say, well, what does that matter? Why do we want to talk about the Antioch church? Why do we talk about the Antioch church today? Well, the Antioch church is... A church, one of the early churches, it's called uh, the Cradle of Christianity, uh, the Antioch Church. It is, as we will see, uh, the first place where this gathering of the nations begins to happen. It's also written, recorded for us in Scripture. It's recorded in this book of Acts, and then we uh, see it's a little bit in the book of Galatians as well. And so the Lord Jesus himself, through the power of the Holy Spirit, wanted us, wanted you and me to know about the Antioch church and to think about the Antioch church and to read about the Antioch church. And as we do so, what we will see is that the Lord Jesus wants us to not just think about the Antioch church, but wants us to see how he works throughout history. Because the temptation is, once we begin to discuss, about, talk about people, and talk about churches, and talk about earthly locations, that we begin to lose our eyes of faith, And we begin to analyze what people do, how people work, how people think. Well, this morning we'll see that it's the Lord Jesus who sculpts his church. And we'll see how he sculpts his church in Antioch. We'll see first that the persecuted Lord, he is the one who gathers. We saw in Acts chapter 10 last week how the Lord Jesus made very clear to the Apostle Peter and then to the rest of uh, the Jews also in Jerusalem that this great ancient wall is broken down between Jews and Gentiles. God shows no partiality. He is not, doesn't show any preferential treatment to any nation, also not the Jews. That Jesus Christ came to save, and Jesus Christ came to save people from every nation, tribe, language, and tongue, and he did so without any partiality, showing no preference for one over the other. And so we saw how the ancient wall is broken down, and now Acts chapter 11, um, in this passage that we're looking at, teaches us how that is carried out. So, 
Historically, around this time, there was great persecution happening in Jerusalem, which caused many of the ancient um, early Christians to scatter from Jerusalem. These are Jewish Christians. They scatter from Jerusalem. We're told in Acts chapter 19, uh, or Acts chapter 11, verse 19, that as this persecution grows and it intensifies, they begin to scatter and they go to Phoenicia, to Cyprus, and to Antioch. Now, sadly, there's a troubling pattern that emerges. Um, Acts 19, or Acts 11, verse 19 says, they speak the word to no one except Jews. It's noticeable to see that phrase here because just a verse earlier, verse 18, the Jews heard that God broke down the ancient walls. They fell silent. They glorified God that the Gentiles now had been granted repentance that leads to life. And what do these Jewish Christians do as they begin to scatter? Well, they tell the, of the repentance to life to Jews. They continue to show preferential treatment. The Jews knew that God was granting life to Gentiles and yet still continued to speak only to Jews. If the growth of the church and if the expansion of Christ's kingdom was left up to human beings, we would very quickly in our selfish nature be disobedient to the command of Jesus Christ. But the point of this passage is that it's the persecuted Lord who gathers. And so Jesus Christ, by the power of his hand, guides certain men in verse 20, men of Cyprus and Cyrene. So these are also Jewish um, Christians that had been scattered abroad um, in uh, the island of Cyprus. Cyrene is a uh, large city on the northern coast of Africa, um, Libya, right across from um, the southern part of Greece. A very uh, um, important city back in those days. And so men from these, they, when they arrive at Antioch, speak also to the Hellenists. This is just a phrase meaning the Greek speakers. Now Antioch... Um, a large city. Cicero calls it a populous city full of the most erudite men and rich in the most liberal studies. It was the third largest city after the great city of Rome and Alexandria. So if you think about the ancient world, Rome, Alexandria, and Antioch, those are the key centers of the ancient world. And so as these men, they come to this ancient city of Antioch, they preach and what do they proclaim? They pro proclaim the lordship of Jesus Christ. Preaching the Lord Jesus. There's an important message in this uh, proclamation. Part of the proclamation would be that Jesus Christ came to earth, lived the perfect life, died on the cross for our sins, rose from the dead, ascended into heaven. But the proclamation that they are going out now is they're saying, this Jesus who was crucified, who was resurrected, and who ascended into heaven, he is now Lord of all. Doesn't matter if you're living in Jerusalem or if you're living in Antioch, there is a Lord who is calling you to submission and obedience because he's coming again one day on the day of judgment. So part of evangelizing is this proclamation, not only of the Savior Jesus, but that Jesus is Lord and he calls you uh, to service and obedience to give your life into his hand. So they proclaim uh, the Lordship of Jesus Christ. And we're told, as they do so, the hand of the Lord is upon them. Jesus Christ, reigning in heaven through the power of his spirit, shows that he is divinely and powerfully at work in this situation. And a great number who believed turned to the Lord, give their life into the 
hand of the Lord Jesus Christ and into service to him. In this city, in ancient Antioch, you see the fulfillment of Old Testament prophecies of nations being gathered. We're given a little glimpse of it here in the book of Acts. You have men of Cyprus and Cyrene, Jewish Christians. But then if you look at verse of chapter 13, verse 1, you see that this church was quite diverse. Now there were in the church in Antioch prophets and teachers Barnabas. So Barnabas was a Jew from, um, had, in Jerusalem, had come from elsewhere. Simeon, who was called Niger, likely a black man from Africa. Lucius of Cyrene, Cyrene also from Africa. Manaean, a lifelong friend of Herod the Tetrarch. So somebody who had been living in the realms of power, a lifelong friend of Herod the Tetrarch, also converted to Jesus Christ and part of this church. The ancient church of Antioch is an incredibly diverse gathering, but what holds them together is Jesus Christ is Lord. And we live not for ourselves, but we live under the direction and the guidance of Jesus Christ. That Jesus brought us together. He is the one who had the word preached to us. He is the one who changed our hearts into service to him. He is the one that now defends and preserves us. Don't lose your eyes of faith in the gathering work of the church of Jesus Christ. We confess in the Heidelberg Catechism that Jesus gathers, prevent, defends, and preserves his church from the beginning of the world to its end. And yet the natural tendency of all of our hearts is to look at human work. Consider what people are doing or what methods people develop or what sermons men might be delivering. rather than seeing Jesus working throughout history, also in our time. Jesus is the one that has brought you here. Jesus is the one that has put us together. Jesus' hand is gathering his church. Some passages in Acts, it's very clear, it's very powerful. You see it in the passage where um, Jesus calls Saul on the road to Damascus, and he says, you will now be my servant. Some passages, it's very explicit, very clear, but here it may not be as explicit as clear, and yet time and again we hear about the Lord's hand, or the Lord was preached, or the Lord was proclaimed. We hear about the lordship of Jesus Christ. And so the persecuted Lord, he gathers, and then we also see how that hand of the Lord shapes. The Jerusalem church be hears about the Antioch revival as we come to our second point. Uh, Jerusalem church hears about Antioch's revival. They send Barnabas uh, to Antioch. Barnabas is described as a good man. He's full of the Holy Spirit, which means that the spirit of Jesus is within him. It's not some subjective feeling, but a direct submission to uh, the Lord Jesus in all of his guidance and of faith. And so Barnabas, he comes to Antioch and he assesses the situation. And verse 23 is a beautiful word, verse. When he came and saw. What does he see? What does he see? What are we told that he sees? Does he see all of the people? Does he see the, the sermons? Does he see the relational investments? Does he see the work people are putting in? Does he see how everyone's working together? No, what does it say he sees? When he came and saw the grace of God. How do you see grace? 
Well, you see grace when you see the church of Jesus Christ gathered. Because that's a work of grace. Sinners, naturally selfish, beginning to live and to serve in a way that defies human explanation. Sinners that naturally deserve a God's judgment, that live without hope in the world, now living with an inner joy and delight that can even walk through difficult times, that can be present at funerals and still be encouraging and give comfort to others. The grace of God gives us hope that earthly circumstance and human work can never accomplish. And Barnabas, as he comes to uh, the church in Antioch, certainly he might have seen all of these different things that was happening, but the word of God says, what does he notice? He sees this is God's grace at work. There's something different happening here. There's forgiveness that's been received and forgiveness that's being given. And there's a joy in living and serving together. The arrogant says, come see what we have done. The child of God, the one who knows Jesus Christ, says, come see what God's done. Because it's not me. It's God's grace working. If it was up to me, my relationship should have fallen apart. If it was up to me, my uh, life should have fallen apart. If it was up to me, I should be in financial ruin. If it was up to me, uh, I should be bound and addicted and my life destroyed. If it was up to me and if it was up to my choices, if it was up to what was going on in my own heart, then there would be no hope, but God's grace gathers and shapes us. It's a powerful encouragement to you and to me to remember to see with the eyes of faith that it's not by might, not by power, but by God's Spirit. That's what God said to Zerubbabel when Zerubbabel faced the reality of building uh, the second temple. Uh, God says, what's this great barrier? What's this great obstacle for you? Don't think with human eyes. It is my hand that works. And that's an encouragement for the church of Jesus Christ in Antioch and for us today. God sometimes uses, often uses, the Bible says God uses the weak and the foolish of the world to shame the wise. There's a powerful story that Spurgeon often told about his own conversion. I'd like to share it with you because I think it emphasizes God's grace. Spurgeon, he recounts, he says, I sometimes think I might have been in darkness and despair now had it not been for the goodness of God in sending a snowstorm one Sunday morning when I was going to a place of worship. He had a place in mind. He wanted to hear a certain preacher preach. But because of the snowstorm, when I could go no further, I turned down a court and came to a little primitive Methodist chapel. In that chapel, there might have been a dozen or 15 people. The minister didn't come that morning. He was snowed in, I suppose. And so then a poor man, a shoemaker, a tailor, or something of that sort, went up to the pulpit to preach. He was obliged to stick to his text for the simple reason he had nothing else to say. The text was, look unto me and be ye saved, all the ends of the earth. He didn't even pronounce the words rightly, but that did not matter. He worked through the text. Look, look unto, look unto me, Jesus, and be ye saved. And his application, picking me out of those 10, 15 people there, he looked right at me and said, young man, look to Jesus Christ.
and the grace of God could be seen that day in that church building. Spurgeon came to faith in Jesus Christ. Jesus works, and Jesus works in ways that defy human explanation. And as we see the glory of church growth throughout the book of Acts, it's not a a handbook or a methodology that says, hey, do it this way or do it that way, or if you do this or that, then you'll be successful. No, it is a call to submission, absolute submission to the lordship of Jesus Christ and the proclamation of his lordship over all people, and that it is only through the cross of Christ that sinners can be saved and saved on that final judgment day. And that's what Barnabas encourages the church in Antioch in. After seeing the grace of God, what does he do? He exhorts them, verse 23, all to remain faithful to the Lord with steadfast purpose. Be faithful to the Lord with steadfast purpose. That word steadfast purpose, it has a sense of intentionality, almost suggesting that this is something you have to plan to do because otherwise you will begin to deviate from faithfulness. You have to purpose You have to say, Jesus has saved, and my life and my longing is so that I may be faithful to my Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, and my life and my habits will be shaped around that great desire. And I'm going to do it not just one day or two days, but with steadfast purpose day after day, because Jesus is Lord of my life. And so Barnabas, he encourages the church, he sees the grace of God and he exhorted them all to remain faithful to the Lord with steadfast purpose. Oh, this is so important for the church of Jesus Christ, especially in this information age of information overload. And that information age and information overload isn't just secular world, it is also Messages from every church that around the world at your fingertips. And there's a danger, a temptation. We lose sight of the one Lord who's calling us to one faith and one baptism. And we begin to think, what's so-and-so doing over there? What's so-and-so doing over there? Rather than saying, God is calling us here Jesus has gathered us, he's put us together, and he's calling us to live with steadfast purpose in faithfulness to Jesus Christ, shaped by his word. It doesn't mean that we're not going to be without challenges. Antioch Church, very briefly, um, did have uh, challenges as we come to the third point, the Lord's body unites. It was in Antioch where this tension of Jew and Gentile was came to the fore. First, it comes to the apostle Peter. As Peter comes to Antioch, Paul sees how Peter first just embraces this idea of eating with the Gentiles, but then the circumcision party, those who still said, no, there's something more that we should be doing. People need to be circumcised. We need to follow the law because otherwise we're not going to be saved. Peter began to eat with them, fearing the circumcision party and Paul accuses him to his face and says, is that really what Jesus died for? So that Jews could continue to live separately trying to keep the law? No, Jesus is the savior of all. And all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. And under the law, under keeping the law, through keeping the law, no one can have salvation. It is only in Jesus Christ. And it is Jesus Christ that gathers everyone together. So it's in the Antioch church where this tension is first worked through, even to the point that this leads to the Jerusalem council in Acts chapter 15. It's Antioch that sent back to Jerusalem and said, hey, you need to speak clearly and boldly to all churches everywhere that that ancient wall has broken down and Jesus Christ is calling all peoples, all nations into one body. And that is only through the cross of Jesus Christ that we're saved. That's what unites us. That's what unites the church of Jesus Christ. 
that we all fall short of the glory of God and that we need a savior and that Jesus died for our sins. It's by faith in Jesus Christ, receiving his forgiveness that we have eternal life and hope and we can begin to walk in newness of love that doesn't show partiality but can live to the glory of God testifying to what Jesus has done. It's in the Lord's body that we find unity. And then in that unity, there's also action as we come to the final point. We can see in the church in Antioch not only this great gathering and then this great growth and this great teaching by Barnabas and Saul, but Jesus Christ saves and then he calls his church to live in the joy of that salvation as Christ on this earth. It's in Antioch that the disciples are first called Christians, which means, oh, those people, they belong to Christ. They do the things that Christ did. What a wonderful testimony to be identified with Christ, to have others referring to you as Christians. So the Lord's body acts, acts in two dramatic ways. The first we see in verses 27 through 30 of Acts 11. There's a coming famine. There's a New Testament prophet, Abagus, just about New Testament prophecy. Abagus is the only instance of a New Testament prophet where he actually foretells future events. Such prophets were part of the foundation of the early church, but today it's clear that there are no such prophets. Um, If you have a question about that, we can talk about that this afternoon, or you can reach out to me. But Agabus prophesies about this famine that is coming, and how does the body of the Lord Jesus Christ act? Well, the same way Jesus acted when there was need. They respond to the need, they gather relief, and they send it generously. Everyone, as they are able, they say, okay, this famine is coming, Uh, there's need that's happening in Jerusalem, we're going to support that need, we're going to fill that need, because God has blessed us. That's what it means to live faithfully to Jesus Christ. To love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, strength, and to love your neighbor, whoever that might be, as yourself. That's one way the Lord's body acts. The second way the Lord's body acts is in Acts 13, verse 1 through 3. The leadership of the church, the very diverse leadership of the church in Antioch is gathered. They're worshiping and they're fasting, teaching us that fasting is a part of the New Testament church. As they're teaching and they're fasting, The Lord Jesus, through his Holy Spirit, says, I want you to be ascending, church. I want you to call Barnabas and Saul and send them to the Gentiles. Call them as missionaries. Install them, lay your hands on them, and send them off. Antioch is the sending church for the Apostle Paul. It's how the Lord's body acts. It not only loves generously, but it continues to share this good news of the gospel of Jesus Christ, that there is eternal life found in Jesus Christ. We can be restored in right relationship with him. And that message is for everyone. And so where we see opportunity to share that, we do so with no partiality. It's a church in Antioch. Apparently within a few uh, decades or century or so, the church had 100,000 Christians gathering in close to 10, 11 major assemblies. This is in a city of 500,000, 600,000. Why do we talk about another church? The word of God guides us to do so. Is it supposed to be a model for us? Do we need to try to be like Antioch? On the one hand, yes. On the other hand, no. 
No, because every church is a unique creation of Jesus Christ. We are unique. You are unique. God's given each one of us unique gifts and talents to fit together into the body of Jesus Christ so that we function in this world in our own unique way. As church, we never try to model or duplicate ourselves based on another church. No, with steadfast purpose, we recognize we are being conformed to the image of Christ. And what does it look like for Christ to live here in the York region? So can Antioch be a model for us? No, every church is unique. But yes, in the sense that we have to rely on the grace of God. The grace of God that calls sinners to salvation and the grace of God that keeps us together because it's only through the grace of God that sinners can continue to grow in deeper relationship with one another. Yes, that we rely on the grace of God and yes, that we steadfastly purpose to be faithful to Jesus Christ in worship, prayer, and perhaps even fasting. Jesus is at work here. His spirit is with us. He calls and empowers us to be his body in our unique context with the unique people that God's given us and that includes you and the unique gifts that he gives to each one of us. May we purpose steadfastly to remain faithful to Jesus seeking his will and guidance in service to him. Amen.